Father God in heaven, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come, we thank you, we praise you, we honor you, Father God, we thank you for another privilege, another honor, another opportunity to come before you. We thank you, Lord, that you have truly smiled on us and you've been good to us. We thank you, Lord, for bringing us this far and blessing us to, to study your word again, Father God. We ask you to bless us as we study your word. Your word will fall on good soil and that we will be made the better. Bless us to run and tell others, Father God, about the goodness of Jesus Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. He's been good to me. Sister Irvin, will you sit near, near this sister so you can share with her? Yeah, share your Bible with her. I kind of pulled her in and she was up with bad Bible study, but I'm glad she came. Amen. So if you would share your Bible with her, that would be a blessing. Will you sit with her and share your Bible with her? That would be good. Amen. God has. He has smiled. He has. He set me free. God has. He has smiled on me. He has been good to me. Amen. Good to see everybody out again tonight. We're in Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Uh, last week we looked at Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. We will look at uh, the meat of that matter tonight. And we will finish at verses, verse number 11. Philippians chapter 1, verse number 11. It's where we will end up. We're going from verse 1 to verse number 11. Amen? Philippians chapter 1, verse, verses 1 through 11. Let's talk about this again. The Apostle Paul is the writer here. We discovered on last week that the Apostle Paul writes this letter from a Roman jail. Some 400 miles away, he writes a letter to the Philippian church. We identified some things last week about the Philippian church. One of the things that we identified was they were kind to Paul. They were kind to the preacher. There ought to be some people that are kind to the preacher. Amen? Yes? yes? There ought to be some people that are kind to the preacher. So Paul, the Apostle Paul, was one who went on missionary journeys, and it is believed that this is his second missionary journey, and he writes this letter to the Philippian church, reminding them, first of all, I've been praying for you all. Isn't that a blessing? When the man of God is praying for you, that is a blessing for you. Amen? He says, verse number three, he says that, first of all, he greets them. He says, this letter is from Paul and from, from Timothy, bond servants. Bond servants mean slaves, those who have been chosen to be slaves of Jesus Christ, and now they are yoked with him, they are bound with him, and they really can't get out of that bond anymore. Once you're saved, you are saved, you are born again, and you can't get out of it. Isn't that something? Would you want to get out of this question? Would you want to get out of salvation? Would you want to turn your salvation in? When I was teaching in the prison, many times the guys had a lot of confusing messages because they heard everybody that came through. So they asked the question, very intelligent questions to them. They would ask the question, well, preacher, what if I give my salvation back? And I looked at them about like y'all looking at me. So they would, they would ask the question, what if I wanted to give my salvation back? Well, first of all, God has given us a gift. The gift is salvation through Jesus Christ and through Jesus Christ alone. Jesus and Jesus alone gives us salvation. The death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ is what assures us of our salvation. We are only saved through the faith that we have in Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Ephesians chapter 2 says that we are saved by grace through faith. Now let me tell you, the grace doesn't belong to us, neither does the faith belong to us, because God has given to every man a measure of faith, so the faith even belongs, belongs to God. 
God even. You know, people oftentimes stand up and say, I got great faith. Well, even your faith came from God. And if you have great faith, it is because you study the word of God because the Bible says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Your faith is increased through the word of God and through the word of God alone. Amen? So we all agree that salvation is free, but it's not cheap. Salvation was granted to us through Jesus Christ, and he paid his life for us. His very life was given to us. So we want to make sure that we understand that we don't have anything to brag about. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says, we can't even brag about it. We can't even uh, jump up and down and beat our chest about it. Therefore, we can't look down our nose at anybody else or complain about anybody else because we are just like them. We are sinners that have been saved by grace, and if we're not saved, then we are sinners that needs to be saved, that need to be saved by grace. Are you with me? So Paul says that we are bond servants. Timothy and I are bond servants of Jesus Christ. In other words, we are yoked with Jesus Christ. You ought to watch who you yoked up with. You ought to watch who you go in business with. You ought to watch who you hang out with. And you certainly ought to watch who you marry. God says, do not be unequally yoked. Isn't that something? Watch who you yoke up with. Now, if you found yourself yoked up with the wrong person, it may just be a little late now. You better make it happen. Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Make the best of it. In other words, the one who is strong in the Lord ought to have a good testimony, a good lifestyle, and that lifestyle will win the one over that is not in the Lord. Amen? So we have to make sure that we watch who we are bonded to. We are bond servants. And let me tell you, if you're not a slave to Jesus Christ, you are a slave to the devil. Because you are a slave to somebody. Some people are slaves to some things. So we need to make sure that we are slaves for Jesus Christ. He says to all the saints in Christ, Jesus Christ, who are in Philippi with the bishops and the deacons. I told you last week, the only two official offices in the church are, the, are, are pastor and deacons. Period. That's it. Now the rest of us, we are servants of the Lord. The pastors and the deacons are servants of the Lord. We ought to be willing to serve just like everybody else. Matter of fact, there should not be a greater servant than the man that's talking to you now. I ought to change the light bulbs. I ought to sweep the floors. I, you know, I, I'm not saying that this is, these are not things that you can't relieve me of, but it's not something that, that I ought to shy away from. Are you with me? So we are great servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says he's right to the deacons, he's right to the pastors, and not only that, he's right to the saints of Philippi. Grace to you, peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now everybody can't say that. Everybody cannot greet you in the name of Jesus Christ. Only those who have Jesus in their lives can greet one effectively greet one in the name of Jesus Christ. Yes? Simply because Jesus gives us what we need, Jesus approves us, and then we're able to speak on his behalf. People who are not saved, they can't speak on behalf of Jesus. People who are not born again cannot speak even the word of God with effectiveness. We must be born again. It is critical for us to be saved, to be born again in this day and time in order for us to reach heaven later on. When y'all going to heaven? Okay, let me try it this way. Is there anybody in the house going to heaven? One nod, one raise his hand. Anybody going? Are y'all going to heaven? Well, if I tell you there's a flight leaving today, you ready? You ready? Everybody said they're ready, you know. 
Everybody want to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. You got to get out of here. You got you to gotta turn this world loose and get out of here. If Jesus came right now, would you be worried? Would you have a problem with it? When you want to say goodbye to your family, your friends, your honey, your baby, that's God's business, right? That's God's business. And if they don't make it, it's all right because the same relationships we have on earth, we won't have over there. You won't be married to him over there. She won't be married to you over there. It really doesn't matter because we're all going to be worshiping the same God over there. Are you with me? So we need to understand that we can only be greeters for Jesus Christ if we're in Jesus Christ. The idea is that we must all find ourselves in Christ so we can have the greatest benefits. Did I say we ought to all have ourselves in the church? We have to be in Christ because coming to church doesn't make you a Christian just like sitting in a garage doesn't make you a car. You believe that? You can pull up in the garage, you can sit there, you can relax, you can hang out there, you can stay there all night, and you will not be a Ferrari. You will be the same old person. Why do people think going to church makes them a Christ? Now, I just left myself wide open there. Because somebody thinks that they ought not go to church. We don't go to church in order to be a Christ, and we go to church because we are a Christ. The church is a fill-up station for us to come to be filled up, to be energized, so we can face a mean, cruel world over and over and over again. That's why we ought not forsake the assembly of coming together with each other. Amen? Verse 3, he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Every time I think about you, I just thank God for you. Every time I think about you. I asked the question last week, when your pastor think about you, what does he think? <laughs> what does your pastor think every time his, your, your, mind, your mind and his mind connect or you cross his mind? So, Sister Davis, what does your pastor think when when he think about you. <laughs> what is your what do you what what do you deserve his thoughts to look like? What do you think your pastor think about you <laughs> when he does think about you? Does your pastor say, Lord, have mercy? Or does your pastor say, Lord, have mercy? Which one? <laughs> When he's praying for you, is he, is he asking the Lord to continue to bless this person to go in the vein that they're going in or to give them, uh, give them understanding or, or to give them increase in the, in the vein that they're going in or is your pastor saying, Lord, turn them around. Lord, fix them. Thank God your pastor's not saying, Lord, kill them. What does your pastor think about you? What do you think? What do you think, sister? What do you think your pastor think about you? Well, he's probably saying, Lord, help him. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's your pastor praying for you? What is he asking the Lord to help you with? <laughs> Lord, help him. Is he, is he saying, Lord, help her or Lord, help me? <laughs> Which one is he saying? Lord help us. Well, that's a good prayer, isn't it? Brother Whitlock, what is your pastor praying for you concerned? How is, how is your pastor praying for you? Well, I hope he's saying, Lord bless him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You want the blessings of the Lord. Lord bless him. Lord bless him. Sister so, Whitlock, what is your pastor praying for you? Depends on the moment. Depends on the day and the moment, huh? Yeah. Depends on the last conversation. Exactly. Because <laughs> it started off good and then it goes. Lord help her. <laughs> I start off saying, Lord, I glorify you, I magnify you, Lord, praise you, Lord, help her. <laughs> well, Paul says that he, every time he thinks about them, every time he remembers them, he prays for them. And then he goes on to talk about why he's praying for them. He says, always in every prayer of mine, 
giving and making requests for you. He says, I'm making requests for you all. Several times in this text, he uses the phrase, you all. The reason why he uses the phrase you, you is plural by itself, right? That's third grade English, we know that. You, when he uses the word you, he's talking about you singular and you plural. But when he says you all, he's saying as a group. Let me just share with you. We are more powerful as a group than we are as an individual. Told you back in the country we had a pot belly um, uh, fire, what do you call it, a pot belly, belly stove. And whenever we wanted the fire to keep going, we would keep adding a, a log to the fire. And at night when we want the fire to go out, we just simply take a log off or a refrain from putting another log on it, and the fire would burn out. We, we never had to pour water on it. All you had to do is separate the logs, and the fire would burn out. And the devil, the devil knows it. The devil knows if he can separate us, the fire will burn out. We will still be saved, we'll still be on our way to heaven, but the fire will burn out. We won't reach other people. We won't have the enthusiasm of reaching other people. The fire will burn out every time if the devil separates us. So what he does is he's called a little issue over here, a little issue over there, a little gossip here, a little backbiting there, and everybody's in an uproar, and now the logs are burning out, the fire is burning out. It is our responsibility to keep the fire burning. It is our responsibility to keep the fervent fire among each other burning. That's why in Mississippi they said like this, they said, we got to learn to love each other where love will run from heart to heart and breast to breast. We got to love each other. Really, really love each other. I'm not talking about fake love. Because folks know when you're faking. People know when you don't want to be around them. They know when you really don't care. They know during the fellowship time when you're doing that little, that little, little, little fake hug you do. Oh, I'm just hugging you because it's hugging time. When we, when we looked at reducing the amount of time we spend in church on Sunday, one of the things that I wanted to make sure that we kept in there was the fellowship period. I wanted to make sure that we, we, we maintain the fellowship period simply because as we maintain the fellowship period, we get to see each other and love each other on a different level. Other than just come to church and worship and look at each other, at least we get a chance to hug and fellowship and talk for a while, say, it's glad, I'm glad to see you, it's good to see you. And that's, that stuff ought to be real, you know, it ought to be real. Because when visitors come, they know when you fake. I wonder what that sister back there said about Sister Irving that night. Did she fake? <laughs> or did she say, oh, girl, <laughs> she giving me that fake smile like I get from every other church member. But no, she's going to leave here and say, those people over there at the New Beginning Church, they're just so loving and so kind. And one lady just left her row and came and sit next to me. And she had this beautiful smile and she was just glad I was here. And she made me feel at home. And I'm going to show up Sunday. I'm going to show up the next Sunday. I'm going to show up Wednesday just because of that first impression that one lady gave me. <laughs> and Paul says, as I'm saying, I'm praying for you. I rejoice over you. Paul says that I have great joy over you. He says, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel. This word fellowship, I told you last week, is kononia, meaning to come together. I wasn't allowed to say it like I want to say it last week, so I said this week. This word kononia means the same as intercourse. The coming together. And when one participates in intercourse, there's an exchange of everything. There's an exchange of personality. There's an exchange of body semen. There's an exchange of body fluids. There's an exchange of blood. There's an exchange of actions. 
That's why when couples are married for a long time, they begin to look like each other. They begin to think like each other. They begin to finish each other's statements off. They can tell you what the other one is thinking when the other one is not in the, in the presence of them. Coming near, fellowship. Paul says that I thank God for your fellowship. Now that's the first thing he said when he says fellowship. The other thing is thank God for your fellowship also means your communication. How you've been communicating with me. I, I, I thank God for your fellowship and how you communicate with me. You're communicating with me. The preacher is saying to the people, I thank God for your communication. Now let me tell you, tell you the last thing that this word fellowship means. What's the first thing fellowship means? It's the word kanania, right? It, mean, it is the same word we get the word intercourse. It means to interchange, to interchange values. When you see a woman walking around here and she's one person the next day, a different person the next day, maybe it's because she's been with so many other men. And she has Joe's personality this moment, Bob's personality the next moment. And that, that, maybe that's why guys change because cause they got Mary Sue and, and Jane all mixed up in them. Because kind of near and kind of near, you exchange some things, even personalities. So the first one is, is intercourse or it, it is fellowship. This word fellowship means to exchange values and personality. What's the second one we say? Communication, right? Paul says, I'm thanking God for your communication with me. Let me tell you the third thing he's saying. I thank God for your gifts toward me. This word is a financial exchange. The same word fellowship is a financial exchange. You see, the, the church at Philippi, they blessed Paul financially. They had a love offering. It is biblical. And they gave love offerings to the preachers. When I became the pastor, before I became the pastor in the New Beginning Church, the bylaws read that there would be no love offering, there would be no pastor's anniversary, there would be, there would be no, no pastor's appreciation, there would be no mother's board, there would, be, there would be no pastor's aid. All of it was geared towards stripping the pastor of any financial gifts. And as I read those bylaws, I asked a question. Why are you making the people do devilish things because of your devilish hearts? This is before I became the pastor. Because you can't tell people who are being blessed by the man of God that they can't bless the man of God. You can't tell the people that they should not be blessed because they are not blessing. Because whenever you bless, God blesses you. And he blesses you over and beyond what you've already given. So, I'm still here. That's why we have a love offering. So the people will have an opportunity to bless the man of God. And so God will have an opportunity to bless the people who have blessed the man of God. Are you with me? So this word fellowship not only does it mean kononia to come together, not only does it mean communicating, it also means financial giving. And see, people, when we, when we talk about finance and giving to the preacher, it loses a lot of people. That's why I'm going to church. That preacher down there got all the money. And he probably broken than you are. But that's just a mindset. He says, you, you helped to finance the gospel. You, you had fellowship with me in the gospel from the first day up until now. In other words, they had no hesitation. There were churches who had hesitations about Paul. Why did they have hesitations about Paul? There were Christian churches that had hesitation about this new Christ guy, Paul. Why? Because he used to be Saul. That's one reason. He used to kill Christians, right? So Paul, which was once Saul, as Saul, he killed Christians off. And they had hesitation. Boy, Saul was a bad actor. 
Saul was a bad actor. I'm telling you, he was a bad actor. So there were several churches that were refraining from giving to him. They were refraining from being around him, and they were simply afraid of him. But Paul says in, in chapter 1, he says that you gave to me from the first day up until now. Isn't that awesome? In order to do that, you have to have faith in God. Because if we had a bad actor walk in the room today and he was known to be a bad actor, it would be pretty tough to trust him. be pretty trusted, tough to trust him when he has a lifestyle of being a I mean, this is Paul's life. He killed them. He, 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 he rid them of their lives. Everybody that said they were Christ, he took their life. But the, the church at Philippi, they gave to him. Paul said, you gave to me from the first day up until now. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ or the day of redemption. Check this out. Paul says, I'm being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you. Who do you think begun a good work in them? Who do you think has begun a good work in them? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, right? God has, right? And God, God has begun this good work in them. And if God has started it, God has put it in motion, he's the one that's going to keep doing it. You see, sometimes people help you out with stuff, and then they want to brag about what they've done for it. You ain't going around some folk who have helped you, don't you? Because they're going to brag about, you know, you were poor, broken, disgusting. I pulled you out. You ain't pulled me nothing. I know that's terrible English, but. <laughs> you know, folk, folk love to brag about what they have done in your life. What they don't understand is, even when they didn't want to do it for you, God unctioned their heart to make it happen. God has begun a good work in me. And God is the one that's going to keep good, doing a good work in me. Because friends get tired. You can mess around and mess up with a friend, make them mad, and it doesn't have to be anything that's real bad. You just make them mad. You just don't show up in two minutes that they thought you should have. <laughs> you just don't say what they want you to say. Just don't lie for them. And they're done with you. But God has begun this good work. And because God has started this work, his, this work that he has started is our salvation. Who started it? God has, right? And he has started this work. And guess what? God is the one that will continue this work. And as he continues the work, it is sanctification. So the work that he has started is salvation. He's guaranteed us a spot in heaven. He has saved us. It's just as if we have not sinned. It is, ju it is justification. God began. God began this good work. Nobody can brag about, even the person who led you to Christ, they can't brag about what they've done for you. God did. As much as I talk about Dorothy Steele, guess what? I understand real well if, if Dorothy had not been there, God would have situated somebody else there on May 6th, on a Tuesday, 1980, in Miss Bonner's sixth period class, room number two, across the hallway from the cafeteria. I bowed my head and invited Jesus Christ into my life that day. If God had not used Dorothy Steele, he would have used somebody else. The good thing about it, she didn't brag about it. She doesn't even remember the day or the time. But I remember like it was a while ago. So whenever people do something for you, that, that, those that brag about it, you don't even want them to do anything else for you. God has begun this work in you, and God will continue this work in you, and God will keep this work in you. That's glorification. 
God has given us salvation. God is giving us sanctification. And God will give us glorification. He has begun a good work in us. Don't let anybody tell you just because you used to be a bad actor, where you used to go was bad. Just remember, God has begun this work in you. Don't let anybody take credit for what God has done. You got a dude talking about that he can save you without a silly cross. Can't even save himself. Same guy said, said that I've done more for Christianity than Jesus did. Doesn't he know that Christianity, Christianity has to have Christ in it? And Christ starts with a C and not a D. Somebody help me right here. God has done it. Give glory to God. Give hope. Give your hope to other people, but also give the credit to God. God has begun a good work in you. And you, he's still talking to people. He's still talking to a group of people. I told you that God can do great things through groups of people when we stick together and on one accord. When people separate themselves, the devil knows how to deal with you real well. For a married couple that walks through the house and they pass each other like they don't know each other, the devil is at work. Somebody got to say, I'm sorry, even if you didn't start the fight, you got to say, well, I apologize. My Uncle Joyce tells a story, and you, some of you have heard this before. If you, if you have, act like you never have. My Uncle Joyce tells the story about how, how my auntie would get on his nerves, and he would retreat and let her have her way. And because he was the one that was closest to God, God had started bothering him. Uncle Joyce said he would go in the room, and then God would, would, would start talking to him about uh, you know you, you, you need to go in there and apologize. Now he began to reason and wrestle with God. Well, God, I'm not the one that started the fight. He said, but you're the one that's closest to me. Now go in there and apologize. He goes in there and apologize, come back in and said, now God, I apologize. He said, yeah, but you didn't look right when you said it. Go back in there and apologize again. And my aunt is a Wallace, so she's taking this thing to the hill, you know. The Wallace girls, they know how to make you do, do things you don't want to do. So he goes back in, and he apologizes again. He comes out and says, now, God, I apologize again. He said, yeah, you apologize. You looked right, but you didn't feel right. Go back in there and apologize again. He goes back in there and apologizes again, comes back. God, I apologize. Yeah, you apologize. You looked right, you felt right, but you didn't mean it. Go back in there and apologize again. Goes back in there and apologize again, comes back and talks to God. Yeah, you apologize. You looked right, it felt right, you meant it, but you had the wrong motives. Go back and apologize again. What I'm trying to get you to see is that if we're going to get along at home or at church, at work, or in the community, it's all about our motives in our heart. God is trying to work on our hearts. And as he works on our heart, he works with our mind. And the whole book of Philippians is written to make us have, to give us the idea of the mind of Christ. We have to have the mind of Christ. We have to move with the attitude of Christ. We have to feel what Christ has felt. We have to love each other. And let me tell you, love ain't no joke. <laughs> love strengthens us and makes us who we are. Love makes us who we are. So he talks to all of them. He says, you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. This thing that has completed, he has started in you, will be completed. It, it, it will continue until it's completed in Jesus Christ, to the day of Jesus Christ. We have to understand that just as it is right for me to think this of you, 
because I have you in my heart. Yeah, you, you stole my heart. Valentine's Day is coming up. Y'all glad I said that, sister? Y'all glad I reminded them? Valentine's Day is coming up. And somebody is going to be looking for Cupid's bow and Cupid's arrow. And let me tell you, that's called Eros love. Or Eros love. It is the love that a man has for a woman and a woman has for a man. It is Eros love. But God is more concerned about your heart and your mind. A godly love. Meaning to love somebody unconditionally. To love people that don't have anything to give back to you. To still have love for them. Isn't that something? We help people that can pay us back. What about the people that's, that will never be able to pay you back? Do you still give to them and still love them anyway? Or are you still waiting? That joker know he you know he owe me some money. When are you gonna let him go? I mean, let him off the hook. You'll spend the rest of your life frustrated. Think about that two, three dollars. And those people go on down the road. They're happy and you still think about it, throwing it over in your mind. God is all after our hearts. It takes agape love to forgive people. It takes agape love to love people that, that don't love you. Dr. King says that love makes us get up and lead others with a drum major mentality, even those that don't love us. On the Salem Bridge, they bowed down on their knees in prayer as dogs were let loose on them. On bloody Sunday, they get loved. I'm so glad that generation was able to do that because the generation coming behind me, they can't do that. The generation coming behind me, they can't even obey mom and dad. The generation coming behind me, they ain't going to put up with nothing, anything. They've lost good jobs because they're not going to put up with anything. Thank God for that generation of the 50s and the 60s. Because they put up with stuff so we can be where we are today. Hallelujah. Generations now can't even keep their mouths closed. But that generation stood for us and they gave their hearts to God. They let God use them. In as much as both in change or in defense and in confirmation of the gospel. Look at what God, what, what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying, even in my chains, I'm going to talk about the gospel. And I'm going to talk about the gospel and I'm going to defend the gospel. Peter says, be always ready to give an answer of the hope that lies within you. Always ready to give an answer. You got to always be ready to give an answer of the hope that lies within you. Do you have a hope within you? We used to have Testimony Sunday on second Sunday. Every second Sunday, right after Sunday school before church start, they would have second Sunday testimony. I didn't realize what was going on because it sounded like to me everybody was, you know, I was analyzing this thing. It sounded like to me that everybody was saying the same thing. My determination is to make heaven my home. People that don't want to talk in church, they had to get up and talk on certain things. My determination is to make heaven my home. And I'm sitting there saying, that's what he just said. And that's what she just said. That's what they said. I mean, the whole congregation gets up and talks about their determination. The only way to make heaven your home is to trust Jesus as your personal Savior. The only way to make heaven your home is to make sure that you believe in the gospel story. The fact that Jesus died, Jesus was buried, Jesus rose, and he was seen according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And this is the gospel. Paul says, even while I was in the chains, I'm bragging about this gospel story. 
Then he says, and there was confirmation of the gospel, and even in my defense, I was talking about the gospel. What are you talking about when you're defending yourself? Oh, man, I didn't do that. What about Jesus? Why don't you just think about Jesus? When we read Acts chapter 7, we have one of the deacons there, Stephen. Stephen lived a short life after he became a deacon because he kept talking about Jesus. These people became martyrs for Christ. We can't even come through the door for Christ. We can't even witness on the street for Christ. We can't even talk to our closest neighbors, family members, and friends for Christ. But we need to tell folks. Paul says, whether I'm in my defense or whether I'm confirming the gospel, let me just tell you, I thank God for you for participating with me. <clears throat> there is confirmation of what God is doing. You ought to have confirmation. God is trying to give us confirmation. Confirmation. God is trying to give us confirmation of who he is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Woe to the man of God who does not preach the gospel. Woe to the person who preaches any other gospel other than this gospel. Paul says, if anyone come preaching to you any gospel other than this gospel, call him a curse. Leave him alone. Don't hear from him. Paul, Paul says to us that we, in, in as much as, as I have done this in my defense and the chain, you know what Paul said? Even when I was locked up, I refused to shut up. <laughs> they threatened some people with putting them in jail. Boy, they ain't going to say nothing about Jesus the rest of their lives. Paul says, even in chain, even in bars, even with, sh with fetters on my feet, even with shackles on my hand, I refuse to shut up talking about Jesus. Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the noonday, Jesus in the evening. Paul just going to talk about Jesus. Then he reminds them that we all are participators. We all are partakers in this grace of Jesus Christ. God has given us all grace. What is he saying? He's saying to us that we need to understand that we all on the same level. And if it wasn't for God's grace, none of us would be here. None of us would be saved. We all, we all are on the same level. You do know that's why this church, yeah, yeah, let me back up. You do know this church is built in the shape of a cross, right? You do know why this church is built in the shape of a cross, right? Why do you think this church is built in the shape of a cross? Pastor Dave is just more dispensable money. <laughs> okay? Do you know where the foot of the cross is? We're sitting at the foot of the cross. The idea is when we come to Jesus, we all are at the foot of the cross. <clears throat> we must be evangelized to get to the foot of the cross. The cross beam is a discipleship. That's why you got classrooms there. The top of the cross is, is the Holy of Holies. That's why we come and fellowship. The Bible says, come, let us uh, step together and fellowship together. That's why we have the cafeteria there. And you all just devour food there. Are you with me? That's why it's built this way. It's simply because we need to understand that we all are here under the same grace and the same mercy given by Jesus Christ. He says, for God is my witness, verse number eight, for God is my witness, how greatly I long for you. For you who? You all. I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. I long for you all with the love of Jesus Christ. Y'all got in my heart. Why do you think, why do you think I would drive 1,400 miles and still show back up on Sunday morning? Committed? I mean, you would drive 1,400 miles and get two or three hours of sleep and <laughs> show up on Sunday morning just glad to be here? Say, so y'all, somebody did it by accident one day? So, 
we have to understand that in our commitment to the Lord and our love for the Lord, we'll do stuff that others won't do for the Lord. One thing I realized well, and I don't know who made the quote, I just say it a lot. In order to have what others won't have, you must be willing to do what others won't do. You must be willing to do today what others won't do in order to have tomorrow what others won't have. You must be willing to do today what others won't do in order to have tomorrow what others won't have. Because there are some people that's missing out on some things for the lack of commitment. So we have to make sure that we have the love of Christ, the affection of Christ. We have to love in the way that Jesus Christ loved. And this I pray for you, for your love, that your love may continue the more and more in knowledge and discernment. He says, yeah, y'all have been faithful to the Lord. You've been faithful to me, but I'm praying that you continue. You know how many people come to church like they're going to put a fire out and all of a sudden they fizz out? Y'all have seen it here at this church. People come in like they're going to set the world on fire for the Lord, and all of a sudden, they just fizzle out. They disappear. They just on fire, and, and everybody, and half of the time, some of the New Beginning members look at see how long he gonna last. <laughs> see how long she gonna last. This Christian walk is a marathon. It's not a 40-yard dash. It's a marathon. We're in the middle of a marathon. The old folk would say, I'm going to serve the Lord the balance of my days. I'm going to serve the Lord the balance of my days. I'm going to be committed. I'm, I'm going to love him. I'm, I'm going to show my love for him and show my love for others. The balance of my days. I'm going to make sacrifices for the Lord. I'm going to do what the Lord asked me to do. I'm going to do what the leader asked me to do. Some people can only follow the leader when they're getting paid. What did I just say? Some people can only follow the leader when they're getting paid. What did I just say? I know what I just said, but what did I just say? Some people can only follow the leader when they're getting paid. What did I just say? Some people won't do anything unless they got money. Okay. Some people won't do anything unless they got money. Get paid for it. What else did I just say? Some people are going to refuse good leadership, whether it's good leadership or not, unless you pay them. I oftentimes tell y'all how we mow about four acres of yard at the church. Back home, we mow about four acres of the yard every week, every Saturday. While other boys were out playing, we out mowing the yard. Only time we got paid is when we went by Brother Lord and Brother Dixon's house, Brother Singleton's house, and sit there and look pitiful. <coughs> and when we look pitiful enough, they said, huh, boy, go on. But we never really got paid for what we did. Because we were trained, we were taught to be committed to the Lord and could be committed to the Lord's work. That's why I have no problem with asking people to do stuff around here. I stop people in the middle of their tracks and say, hey, wait, wait a minute, can you stop this and do this? Why did I do that? Because I don't know any other way. It's called commitment to the Lord. When we are committed to the Lord, we will do things based on our knowledge and discernment. Paul says, I am praying for you all that you will gain knowledge and discernment, that you will have a good understanding, that you will do what you need to do, and we won't have to pry you to do it. We won't have to bribe you to do it. A lot of people wouldn't be in jail if they didn't accept the bribe. If we have integrity, if we walk in integrity, and if we don't get caught up in greed, we won't end up in prison sometimes. I know there's a bunch of brothers in prison, a bunch of sisters in prison that don't need to be there. But the bottom line, we can't get caught up in greed. 
we got to make sacrifices unto the Lord. He says that I, I want you to have more knowledge. And I want you to have more discernment. What is discernment? What does it mean I want you to have discernment? Who's talking? King judgment, insight, understanding. understanding, discernment. I discern that you are a devil. <coughs> Am I on target? <laughs> See, people don't like to talk about that in the 21st century. But in Bible days, the prophet spoke and he didn't tell everything good that's going to happen to you. One prophet said, by in the morning, your head will be cut off and the birds will be eating out of your neck. That's what the prophet said. And guess what? When the sun came up the next morning, he was impaled on a pole, his head was decapitated, and the birds was, was eating out of his neck. But the prophets we got up today, you know what they say? Oh, God is going to bless you. You're going to be blessed. You're going to be blessed. And God is going to bless you. And the blessings going to overflow and run over and catch you. And then you, you gonna, the blessings going to run you down. Every time I see a post that says, uh, if, you, if, you, if you send this to 10 people, the Lord is going to be, the Lord is going to bless you. You know what I say? If you worked last week, the Lord is going to bless you this week. See, that's what false prophets do. Everything is about a blessing. Everything is about a blessing. That's what false prophets do. That's what false prophets do. The prophets of old, they predicted you're going to die in a moment. And I and Sapphire got together before they got to church, came down the highway. She lied, she died. He lied, he died. And they walked them out. They, they carried them out. The six strong men carried them out. That's why I tell folk, you need to come to church where you can walk in on your own so six strong men won't have to bring you in. Are you with me? So we need to understand that we need to have a spirit of discernment. People can't get everything over on you. If people would discern things better, understands things better, reason with God better. The knowledge you have is good, but you got to know what to do with it. You got to have a spirit of discernment. You, you have to, you, you, you won't become so gullible and everything takes over. That you may approve the things that are excellent. We, we ought to be able to walk in excellence. You want to know why people talk about people that walk in excellence? You know why? I'm glad you asked him. People talk about people who walk in excellence because they're not excellent. Because they're not walking in excellence. Bishop Jimmy Dixon says it like this. He says, excellence shines a spotlight on mediocrity. Excellence exposes mediocrity. Excellence sits there and shines a spotlight on mediocrity and everybody else can see mediocrity that they did not see before. Are you with me? Excellence. We got to walk in excellence. That's why we, we, we have to walk in excellence in such a way that everything we say, everything we do, we ought to have excellence in mind. The psalmist says in 8, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Who is man that you are mindful of him, that you have created him just a little lower than the angels? O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. If we serve an excellent God, we ought to carry ourselves with excellence. On life support, somebody asked me how I was doing. Guess what I said? 
I'm excellent. I still got breath in my body. I'm excellent. Boy, I know somebody would have given them a health report. Well, you know, my rheumatism, my arthritis, and I ain't been able to breathe and all. Whatever God leads me in the direction he leads me in, I am excellent because I serve an excellent God. Doesn't matter. If I get what I want, I'm still excellent. If I don't get what I want, I'm still excellent. God has given me another chance to raise my voice and say that I'm excellent because we serve an excellent God. And I'm excellent. That you may be sincere without, without offense. Without getting all torn up, all being out of shape. To the day of Christ. Being filled with the fruit of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. Paul is saying here in verse number 11, Philippians chapter 1, that we ought to have a twofold goal. We ought to have a goal to focus on God in such a way until we glorify him. We ought to have a goal to glorify God. We ought to glorify him in our words, or glorify him in our actions, Glorify him in all that we have done. We ought to glorify God. Secondly, he says, we ought to praise him. We ought not just praise him on Sunday morning. We ought to praise him every day of our lives. We, we ought to praise him and give glory to him just because of who he is. We ought to praise him. Praise God. We ought to praise God in such a way until we celebrate him until others see our celebration. Until others feel our celebration without saying a mumbling word. Praising God ought to be so contagious until it, it, it breaks out over here and it breaks out back there. It breaks out over here. It breaks out back there. Let me tell you, we ought to praise the Lord. We ought to praise him in such a way and glorify him in such a way that God gets the glory. Our whole objective on planet Earth is to glorify God, to be servants that glorify him. Amen? Amen. Homework for next week is, is uh, Philippians chapter 1. I know you all read that old chapter before you got here. And so tell me what we're going to bag up against in the future with, from verses 12 on. Somebody tell me what we're, gonna look, what we're looking forward to seeing verses 12 through the end of the chapter. Verses 12 through 30 because y'all read it and y'all all prepared for it. Uh, tell me where we're going. Tell me what we're going to look at. We're talking about the mind of Christ, right? Now don't go to your to your Bible and look at the pericopes and, and see where it says uh, Christ is preached to live is Christ uh, uh, striving and suffering for Christ. I don't want to hear that. I can read that myself. Tell me where we're going. Verses, nine, verses 12 through verse 30. Where are we headed? What are we going to talk about? Hmm? We're going to talk about Christ. The first 11 verses, he's talking about joy and how to rejoice, right? He's talking about having the mind of Christ, having walking in righteousness, walk, walking in right living, having our mind focused on doing the right thing. Huh? Oh, uh, here we go. <laughs> We're going to live like Christ. Anybody read? Anybody read ahead? Anybody read the chapter? Did y'all just, just wait on me to come in here and chew it up and put it in your mouth? Okay, homework. Chapters 1 and 2 for next week. Chapters 1 and 2 and make you some outlines and some notes for chapters 1 and 2 of Philippians for next week. That's our, our homework assignment, okay? Chapters 1 and 2 for next week. Take each pericope and write your five notes out of each, each pericope. Amen? Chapters 1 and 2. Be ready to hand your homework in when you walk in. And don't skip Bible study. Do not skip Bible study. Bring your homework. If you skip it, 
Then you, you go ahead to chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4. If, if you don't make next week, amen? So chapters 1 and 2 is our homework for next week. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for another privilege, another honor, another opportunity to come before you. Lord, we thank you, Father God, that we are bond servers together with Christ Jesus, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we have the mind of Christ, that we are focused on Christ, and we are focused to do those things that are pleasing in your sight. Now, Lord, we ask you to give us the strength, give us the hope, give us the excellency to walk in Jesus Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. What's your homework assignment for next week? Chapters 1 and 2, Philippians. Philippians chapter 1 and 2. Let me thank those who joined us by live broadcast. Thank you for joining us here at the New Beginning Church, 4251 Shiremai Road. We're glad you've come to visit with us. Please come by and visit with us on Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. and continue to follow us on our broadcast at 11 o'clock a.m. Uh, if you want to donate to this ministry, you can do so by cash app. Our cash tag is NBC Souls. Cash tag NBC Souls. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Be blessed.